Here's the fourth action potential that I'm going to teach you today. And this action potential um, is found in the actual contractile fibers. So these are going to generate, these are the cardiac muscle fibers that are going to generate force, okay? And a cardiac muscle fiber, if you go back and you review your anatomy, these are branched cells. They contain uh, striations, just like in skeletal muscle, and those striations are actin and myosin, Z-discs and M-lines, and these cells contain tropomyosin and troponin, and they respond to calci calcium release exactly as skeletal muscle fibers do. Their histology is a little bit different because they are smaller cells, they're branching, they don't have multiple nuclei, but the effect is the same. These sarcomers are going to shorten in length and generate force. But before any of that can happen, we need to generate an action potential within the contractile cell. This is just like the skeletal muscle. Think back. Remember, for skeletal muscle, we had to have an action potential in that um, neuron, the somatic motor neuron, which went, then released acetylcholine at the synapse, which then triggered the opening of the nicotinic receptors, which then triggered an action potential in the sarcolemma. So that's essentially the process in skeletal muscle for cardiac muscle, the, we're not dealing with a synapse of neuron and muscle. Instead, we're dealing with those intercalated discs that allow for the electricity to travel from the SA node or the AV node or the Purkinje fibers through those electrical conduction um, processes through gap junctions found at the intercalated discs. So we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. So we're going to start out then with the cardiac muscle cell, which has a resting membrane potential of minus 85. Now that should ring a bell. That is the resting membrane potential of um, skeletal muscle too. And so this minus 85 is where we're starting out. Now the contractile fiber does in fact have a true resting potential. You'll notice that it's not drifting upward like the pacemaker potential. This is a resting potential, and you can see it again over here. Now, once we reach threshold, okay, once we reach threshold by that, from that electrical signal that passes through the gap junctions into the contractile cell, we're going to get depolarization, and that depolarization is due to voltage-gated sodium channels. This is very similar to skeletal muscle again. And so we've got the voltage-gated sodium channels. The sodium rushes into the cell. So we have that influx. Now, a little bit below minus 20, right about, oh, right there. Um, and we're going to go ahead and just round it up to minus 20 for sake of ease. But uh, so at about my, I'm sorry, not minus, positive. At about positive 20, those sodium, voltage-gated sodium channels are going to close. And this, again, similar to the skeletal muscles, they close. And potassium, voltage-gated potassium channels open. So at this peak right here, that's where we get the closure of the voltage-gated sodium channels and the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels. Um, now, that potassium, so let's take a look. That potassium begins to repolarize right here, but something else also happens. In addition to the voltage-gated potassium channels, we get the opening of a voltage-gated calcium channel known as the L-type calcium channel. L doesn't stand for anything fancy. It just is long, the long channel as opposed to the short channel. That's really all there is to it. Um, 
but it's the L-type calcium channel. Now that channel is functionally related to the DHP that we saw in skeletal muscle. It's not identical. Remember in skeletal muscle that DHP channel was physically connected to my ryanidine receptor and yanked that ryanidine receptor open. But in the cardiac muscle, that doesn't happen. Instead, that L-type calcium channel related to my um, DHP receptor is going to allow my sodium into my cell, which will then, I'm sorry, my calcium into my cell, which is going to have an interesting effect. For every potassium that leaves my cell, so if this is my cell membrane and my potassium is escaping that cell membrane and making my cell more negative, right? That's the, that's the idea. So for every potassium, every two potassiums that are leaving, I've got some calcium coming in. And that calcium brings positive charge back into my cell. And so it's going to counteract the effect of the potassium. Now it's not exactly a one-to-one -one exchange in terms of charge. You do get an excess of potassium leaving, but it's enough to cause this plateau region right here. Uh, we call it a plateau, okay? Plateaus are flat. This is not exactly flat. You can see that it still continues to repolarize, but it's repolarizing very slow. Without these calcium channels, this would look like a skeletal muscle. Boop. But the calcium channels are there, and so the calcium channels cause this plateau to exist. Now they start to close, okay? They start to close within this range right here. And as the calcium channels close, the potassium channels remain open. And so once this is out of the picture, uh, potassium can now repolarize the cell back to that minus 85. Now, this plateau is functionally significant, and we're going to talk about that in detail when we uh, talk about refractory periods in the, skeleton, in the cardiac muscle. But I want you to kind of think about this, this um, active learning question. We'll leave this here for you, and again, you can kind of pause this and ponder this. It's in your uh, PowerPoint as well. But I want you to look at this slide here. And I want you to kind of form some hypotheses as to what would happen if I blocked these channels here. Or what would happen if I changed my concentrations of potassium or, or calcium or sodium. Uh, so spend some time walking through there, mostly because by answering these types of questions, you're really going to start to understand the process here and what's happening.